Hello, and welcome to Time of Death. I'm your host, Dee. And I'm your host, Briss. And together we are Time of Death. If you are new here, welcome. We are two nurses that like to talk true crime. We like to focus on cases that have a heavy medical influence to them or cases that feature a medical professional as the perpetrator or the victim. So, confession. What? Briss, I went off script. How? Well, you see, neither the victims or the patients or the perpetrator are healthcare people. You know what? As long as it's a medically interesting case, I think it's fine. I think it's covered under our umbrella of what we do here. Because we've done cases before that don't really have a medical professional at the you know, heart of the case, but as long as it's it's something that's interesting, informative, and will help us learn and understand things. And guess what? I make the rules. Fair Fair enough, enough. co-host. Go ahead. You mean lead host? What? You did not contest when I said I make the rules. That's true. I guess you're the head of this operation now, and you have all the responsibility of it, so next week you'll be doing the case. (laughs) I will just be an innocent no. bystander. <laughs> no, no, you, no, no, you slick little fool. All right. Anyways, I'm going to get into it because it's kind of a longer case. And I want to make sure that I am giving plenty of time. So buckle up. Saddle up. Saddle your ponies up. Yes. We ride. Dawn. Just a disclaimer. This is not based Uh, on things that we definitively know this is speculation just making that very clear we don't have any proof this is just us armchair hypothesizing these are just our own thoughts and opinions based on research by d thank you so i'm taking you guys back back in time back into the entertainment industry exciting In the shadows of a youthful career, an entertainment industry lies a chilling healthcare mystery that potentially, and I'm saying this potentially, because this is all hypothetical, there's no proof. Mm -hmm. So this is a conspiracy. Yes, because I'm the queen of conspiracy. You are. Conspiracy queen. My my title. Watch, I'm going to wear a tinfoil hat next time. (laughs) A crown. If only we had, like, (laughs) video podcast then you all could see us in our true form yes it's true d wearing her tin hat crown tinfoil crown her tinfoil crown queen Uh, of the conspiracies queen of the conspiracy but anyways i digress i digress i'm gonna digress i digress so this potentially intersects with the medical diagnosis of an iconic actor have you heard Of Michael J. Fox. Of course I have. For Canadian native Michael Fox, his journey into fame took an unexpected twist when during his teenage years, he worked on the set of a very popular sitcom by CBC called Leo and Me from 1977 to 1981. And this was shot in the vibrant city of Vancouver. I never heard of Leo and me. So you're like me and you had no idea about this show because I'm a 90s kid. I'm a 90s kid. (laughs) So what exactly was Leo and me about? What was it about? Let me tell you. Okay. Leo was portrayed by actor Brent Carver, a vivacious Italian explorer. Mm -hmm. So basically, Leo had a high stakes poker match where... in it, he won like this dilapidated yacht. And during the show, him and his orphaned nephew, Jamie, who Michael J. Fox played, they basically are doing like a renovation on the yacht and they go on adventures. And the show is known for the character that Fox plays, Jamie, is very quick witted and basically helps get the duo out of trouble all the time. So it sounds like a really cute show, Mm -hmm. but it was like a really big hit. 
And that was what kind of propelled Fox's career. So little did Fox know, or anyone on the movie set for that matter, that this breakthrough role in showbiz would become a pivotal chapter in his life, not because of stardom, but rather the fact that it would shape the rest of his life. Some researchers speculate that during his time on set, Fox was exposed to something. Exposed to what? Hypothetically, a virus. However, I speculate there have may there may have been something else that caused his illness. So is this your conspiracy or is this a conspiracy? This is a conspiracy. I did not. This was from Reddit. Thank you, Reddit. Thank you, Reddit. Love you. But I thought it was so freaking interesting. And I went down the rabbit hole. Okay. So what was Fox exposed to? So what we will talk about is the potential, and I have to say potential because I don't want to get sued, catalyst for his diagnosis later on in life of Parkinson's. Oh, okay. I think I've heard vaguely about this. Briss, do you want to let them know what Parkinson's is? My medical? Shaggy dementia. Shaggy dementia? So, Parkinson's disease, for those of you who don't know, it's like a neurological disease. It affects people's nervous systems, and it can cause a lot of symptoms. They can have some issues with mobility, some issues with coordination. They can have trouble, like, even swallowing Mm -hmm. sometimes. And uh, they can have dementia related to Parkinson's, which is pretty common as well. So, unfortunately, there's no cure for Parkinson's, but a lot of people are put on medications that can help alleviate some of the severe symptoms that they're experiencing. Just to elaborate on what Riss said, researchers have found that exposure to things like viruses, like influenza, like these really typically benign viruses, prions, environmental toxins, can cause Parkinson's to be dormant for years and years and then be triggered at some point by whatever spontaneously or some other medical condition causing a debilitating Parkinson's is debilitating illness down the line. Yeah, exactly. So definitely viruses or other triggers in someone's environment, but also a major cause is genetic. Um, A lot of the times, if it runs in your family, you could be predisposed to it. Okay, but prions are another cause. But today, we're going to be talking about those prions. So Dr. Donald Kalney, the esteemed director of the Neurodegenerative Disorder Center at the University of British Columbia Hospital, that is a mouthful, he shed some light on the fact that oftentimes Parkinson's, like any other illness, may have clusters. Clusters are like a group of individuals who all develop the same disease. It's unusual and usually like turns heads because a lot of times, like if a group of people who are in the same workplace develop like a certain type of cancer mm-hmm. and they're all in the same space, then you want to rule out an environmental cause, right? Yeah. But sometimes it does happen spontaneously. However, what was really weird about the situation is that the individuals who are involved in the set of Leo and me, Michael J. Fox, and three other co-workers were diagnosed with Parkinson's. How old was Michael at this time? When he was on set? Mm -hmm. He was a teenager. Dang. So it just laid dormant for years. Hypothetically, for years. On average, Parkinson's only affects one person in every thousand people. Okay. Keep in mind, on the set, there was only a grand total of 125 people. Mm -hmm. So the math ain't math then. The math ain't math then. So Dr. Kalney is also responsible for the care of two of Michael J. Fox's former colleagues from the sitcom. 
And again, he says, quote, it could be a coincidence, but it's intriguing. It might be something that they were exposed to. Dot, dot, dot. What could they have been exposed to? Well, let me tell like you. a certain kind of food or chemical, maybe. I'm going to introduce a new character into the story tonight. Okay. Introducing Robert William Picton, better known as the pig farmer killer. Or I've the, heard about this man. Or the butcher. One of Canada's most notorious serial killers. He was born on October 24th, 1949 in Port Coquitlam. It's these freaking French names, man. Coquitlam. Coquitlam. Say it again. Coquitlam. 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 In British Columbia. However, Picton's life would haunt the nation for years to come. Mm. That sounds ominous, right? Yeah. Very thoughtful, Bernie. Well, I literally sat there. I was like, I have to really write everything out because my brain has been absolute crap shoot so i was like let me write it out that i'm at this point right now where if i don't write it down then we'll forget it moments later but i'm like i don't want to make it sound like i'm just reading off of it you know what i mean yeah but i'm like hmm i write literally <laughs> have almost everything i say down before i do because <laughs> if it's not down on paper it's I'm not there at all <laughs> it's not there anymore i get it I, I try to came up with all these cute little phrases like I can't remember. I can't recall now because I didn't write one, it down. What was the one that we came up with? Chuckle, chuckle, cuckoo, chuckle. Nutto? Nutto! Oh my God. <laughs> Nutto. Well, our villain, Robert, was Choco. Nutto. Nutto. The Choco. <laughs> you just said it. <laughs> Choco, Nutto. Nutto. I mean, what am I craving right now? Should we get ice cream after this? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's focus. Focus. So, Robert was born into a family deeply entrenched in pig farming. Do you see what I did there? Because pigs... Mm. In trenches. Yes. Very clever. And his childhood was marked by hardship and neglect. His parents, Leonard, Leonard... Leonard, 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 Francis Picton, and Louise Helene Arnal prioritized their farm over their children, not just child, because he had siblings, mm -hmm. and subjected their children to long hours of labor, causing them, their children, to severely neglect their hygiene. Picton, along with his brother David, worked the farm from a young age, enduring the harsh conditions and their parents' demanding expectations. Their parents' neglect extended to their appearance, and they often went to school dirty, unwashed, and in stinky clothes, earning them the nickname Stinky Piggy. I think he was pretty, like, brutally bullied, if yeah. I remember right, right? He was. He was definitely. But his classmates like, called him, like, Stinky Piggy, like... Very, very nasty. Very, very mean. You know what? I don't condone, obviously, his serial killings later on, but kids can be so nasty. Absolutely. I was just thinking about this the other day. Like, when people, like, when your children are mean, that usually means that the parent is mm -hmm. really nasty as well. Because it's what they know. Absolutely. They're just repeating what they know. There was, like, a meme or a cartoon online that was, like, the, the the like parent is talking and it's like the parent's mouth is the child's mouth. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was an apt description. It's true. Kids repeat what they know. Mm -hmm. They learn by, you know, imitation. So the, like, that was a great point, Russ. Very true. I love it. What can I say? You're bringing in the heat tonight. As the number one employee of your podcast. You're pro bono. Pro bono is that is. We're both pro bono. We do this for the love of the podcast. We do it for the love of crime. That sounds <laughs> so ominous. <laughs> we love crime. Yes, we do. 
I just think of it. Why do we like crime so much? True crime so much. I think it's just like it's fascinating sometimes when people can be so cruel and evil. And like it's it's kind of interesting to see what people are capable of. What does it say about our psyches, though? We do love to be together as a side point. Yes, we do love to be together, too. But I really feel like everybody needs to take a break sometimes from true crime. Like, I remember I was talking to my friend. I showed her a podcast I listened to, Rotten Mango, which, shout out Rotten Mango. Stephanie Sue, if you ever listen to this. Stephanie Sue. Shout us out, Stephanie. Shout us out, please. But some of her cases, especially the early on ones, were so gruesome. Yeah. Uh, Just a forewarning. And I was telling my friend about it. And she's like, how do you like, I listen to them like back to back. I'd be like at the gym, <laughs> folding my laundry, yeah. you know, just doing everyday things, everyday things. And she's like, how are you listening to this case at the gym right now? And I was like, it's just like, but you know what? And I think the same thing goes for nurses or other medical professionals when they're at work and they see really traumatizing things. Uh-huh. And it's just, you just kind of brush it off. Because you can't deal with it at the time. It's kind of like that, with the kind of thinking. It's you're desensitized to it after a while. That's so sad, though. Yeah, it is sad. Because when you think about it, like, you're desensitized to hearing, like, about this stuff. But I almost look at it as, like, a preparation. If if anything were to go wrong, like, I would like to think that my hundreds of thousands of hours of listening to true crime would help prepare me. Yeah. And, you know... Kind of like I decided to start swimming mostly because I want to be prepared if I ever need to swim. You live on the second floor. What what flood are you preparing for? <laughs> what well, you flood? know what? Same thing for being a nurse. I think, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I have to leave ER nursing. And then it's like, wait, you need to stay in ER nursing because what if, you know, something traumatizing happens to you and your family later on the line, you're not prepared to handle it. That that is like a really interesting take. (laughs) I'm like, if I, you know, maybe one day I I end up having kids or something happens to our family, then I want to (laughs) be the best prepared person I can be. And if I quit ER nursing now, then I won't. (laughs) I'll still have like some of my skills, but. That is so cute. That is like the cutest thing you've ever said. (laughs) I'm also preparing. It's like when we all inevitably lose our mind. We're going to be fine on all fronts. We we covered all the bases. <laughs> okay. Anyway, back to Picton. All right. So, so says Picton or Picton? Wow. You're really making fun of him too. Picton. No, I didn't. I was impressed because <laughs> I was pretty clever on the spot. I was like, wow. What do you make it? You know what, guys? I come up with all of these titles. Aren't they catchy? You do not come up with all of them. Like 90%. Superstar killer. I was like, you gotta be shit. I was, I was like, you gotta be joking me. And the last sure one. enough, sure enough. Yeah, I named it that. I was like, I don't know why I thought it was such a good name. Okay, but listen, Colchazine Cocktail. That was a good that one. Was a good that name. was D. Okay, that to be was, fair, that, was that one name. was D. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, but did you like my other one the other day? Which one? Um, the last case you did, I think it was, um, Deep Deep Gupta, mm. and I called it Cradle to Graves. Get I it? Because like she was that. a neonatologist. And she was pregnant. And she was pregnant. Oh my God, I didn't even think of that part It's a now. double entendre. But that was a clever one, that was, was it clever. not? That was clever. All right, I'm done. I should just stop being an ER nurse and go into something more creative. Don't quit your day job. All right. So... Picton, not Pigton, Picton, was very close with his mom. However, his relationship with his dad was not good. His dad was abusive, and Picton was very detached, really didn't have much emotional support from his dad. And partially because of their neglect, he struggled academically. He eventually dropped out of school when he was 16 to pursue work as a meat cutter. Okay. In the following years, Picton was very involved in his family's business, working on their farm alongside his brother. 
tragedy struck in 1978 and 1979 when their parents died, leaving him and his brother. His sister also inherited the farm, but she was not involved. Okay. So the two boys were, and I say boys, but they were men, mm -hmm. in charge of running the farm. And because of this, they did not have the oversight from their parents. And the farm life took a very dark turn. So how old were they when they took over the farm? So they took over 1979. And he was born... 1949, so he's 30 years old. Oh, okay. Their family farm became, like, a eyesore and, like, a really creepy haunt. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a massive 600-pound boar that kind of just patrolled the farm. Which oh, my it, God. And Picton and his brother were very reserved. They didn't engage with anyone and just like a very eerie, creepy vibe mm -hmm. from the two of them. On March 23rd, 1997, Wendy Lynn Esseter informed the police that Picton had handcuffed her and stabbed her multiple times, which was wild she managed to escape got medical attention for her injuries and he also sought out medical attention at that time despite this like the seriousness of the situation mm -hmm. what had happened robert was released on only a two thousand dollar bond oh boy the attempted murder charge against him was dropped, with prosecution saying that Wendy's drug addiction made them doubtful that they could secure a conviction. You know, people who use drugs and use alcohol mm -hmm. are more vulnerable because they're altered. Absolutely. And that's just, I don't know, just especially like with um, trigger warning, like sexual assault victims where, you know... They're attacked for drinking or using drugs prior to the assault. That that's just dirty to me because just because someone has used drugs does not mean that what they're saying is invalid. Absolutely, and I think that society tends to look at people who use drugs as like subhuman, which mm -hmm. is really terrible and awful. Yeah. Like even the language surrounding drug use, like "oh, you're dirty," like "my urine's dirty," or "your urine's yeah. dirty," or you need to get clean. Like, that language is just really... I never thought of that, but that's such a good way to put it. That's so... I never thought about that. But, yeah, you're so right. Like, saying someone who uses those substances is, like, unworthy. Mm -hmm. It's really terrible. But, unfortunately, the police did the same thing to this young woman. Robert's brother, David, was convicted previously in 1992 for sexual assault as well clearly establishing that there are some troubling things going down in the Picton family and this was also a step this also established a clear connection to criminal activity the Picton brothers had blatant disregard for the legal boundaries not only in terms of like sexual and physical assault but in their own personal, how they conducted themselves as well, professionally. They faced lawsuits from the police department for violating zoning ordinances on their farm. So they had converted their large farm, like a building, into a venue. They, like, hosted these raves and wild parties. Oh, my God. <laughs> these two re really reserved men. Oh, my God. They had thousands of attendees, some of which were the Notorious Hells Angels, mm. biker gang, and sex workers from Vancouver. Okay. Because Vancouver is only 45 minutes away. They went on to, like, continue hosting and just blatant disregard. Even in the face of legal pressure, the government had an injunction banning future parties after their 1998 New Year's Eve event, 
and they just continued to just ignore anything that the police or the law enforcement said. Okay. However, authorities went on to disband their nonprofit organization named the Picky Palace Good Time Society. So they really leaned into the the Piggy Palace Good Times The Piggy Palace <laughs> Good Times Society. Oh, I don't know. It sounds like an interesting place. Well, they disbanded it after the brothers refused to produce financial statements. <laughs> so they just did not care on so many levels. Fast forward to February 6, 2002. Police descended upon the Picton property. Do you like the alliteration? Police proceeded, proceeded to pick apart, just to pick, to pick apart the property, the, the, the Picton, the Picton property. property, the Picky Picton property, the Piggy Palace, because they had a search warrant for illegal firearms. The arrests of both Picton brothers followed, and they ended up getting a second warrant to extend the search as part of the British Columbia Missing Women's Investigation. Mm. Ding, 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 red flag. What they discovered sent shockwaves through the nation. Canada was shook. Multiple personal effects belonging to missing women were uncovered on their farm. Ah. The next day, Robert faced charges related to weapons offenses. Both brothers were initially released. However, Robert remained under police surveillance. Being released and under surveillance, his legal troubles were just beginning. On February 22nd, 2002, Robert was arrested and hit with two counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson. The charges just kept racking up, with additional counts added for the murders of Jacqueline McDonald, Diane Rock, Heather Bottomley, Andrea Josberry, Brenda Wolf, Georgina Pappen, Patricia Johnson, Helen Hallmark, Jennifer Furminger, Heather Chinock, Tanya Holik, Sherry Irving, Inga Hall, Kara Ellis, Andrea Borhaven, Deborah Lynn Jones, Marnie Frey, Tiffany Drew, Carrie Koski, Sarah DeVry, Cynthia Felix, Angela Jardine, Wendy Crawford, Diana Melnick, and Jane Doe, bringing the total to a staggering 27 first degree murder charges. Wow. And I wanted to make sure. That I said all of their names, and I said all of their names as best pronunciation I could. Because yeah. these poor women. That's terrible. So, they began to excavate the farm. And they did not anticipate what happened to happen. By November 2003, the cost of the excavation investigation had exceeded $70 million. Mm -hmm. The property was fenced off and under the jurisdiction of British Columbia. With the exception of one small barn, all the buildings on the farm had been destroyed. Forensic analysis posed significant challenges due to the decomp of the bodies and potential consumption by pigs and insects on the property. Oh, God. It gets worse. In a disturbing twist, it was revealed that Picton may have consumed his victims himself, and worse yet, he may have incorporated the human flesh into pork products that he sold to the public, prompting health warnings from the authorities. Oh, my God. Allegations also surfaced saying that he may have directly fed the human remains to his pigs. Ugh. The legal saga continued, including evidence Picton had worn, the clothing and the boots, when he assaulted Wendy. They were seized, DNA tested, and revealed chilling connections to those other victims on his clothing. So the clothing that was part of the assault for Wendy, showed trace DNA evidence of the other victims. That's basically what I... Wendy, which one's Wendy? The one, the one who that was... he stabbed. Okay, all right. Lab staff discovered approximately 80 unidentified DNA profiles on various items. So even, he must have killed a lot more. more. Way more. 
both female and male victims. Oh, boy. Inside his trailer, authorities found disturbing items, including a loaded twenty two revolver with a dildo affixed to the barrel. Oh, God. Uh, magnum handgun ammunition, night vision goggles, fur, handcuffs, syringes containing blue liquid, and Spanish fly aphrodisiac. Ew. Okay. So just a little context. Pictured went on to say that the dildo was like a makeshift silencer, which was not true. That was debunked. He's just nah. That's just disgusting. I don't even know what to say to that. Video evidence emerged where Picton's close friend, Got Chubb, recounted a conversation in which Robert alleged that injecting a female heroin addict with windshield washer fluid mm. was a good means to kill her. Another tape featured. <gasps> wait, wait, wait. Is that the blue liquid? Yep. Oh, my God. Another friend named Andrew Bellwood said that Picton often murdered sex workers using handcuffing, strangling, bleeding, and gutting them before feeding their remains to his oh pigs. The trial ended on December 9, 2007, where the jury found Picton not guilty on six counts of first-degree murder but convicted him on six counts of second-degree murder. Two days after, after they were listening to the victim impact statements, the Supreme Court judge, Justice James Williams, sentenced Robert Picton to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole for 25 years. The maximum penalty of second-degree murder. So what might happen, you might say, D, what does this have to do with Leo and me? D, what does this have to do with Leo and me? <laughs> well, Leo and me filmed from 1977 to 1981, right? hmm And his parents, Robert Picton's parents, died in 1978 and 1979. When did he insult Wendy? He assaulted Wendy 1997. So Robert assaulted Wendy in 1997 and parents died in 79? Yep. So I know it sounds... So roughly 20 years. Yes. But there was a period of time that there would have been overlap between the two. After Robert was arrested, witness Lynn Ellingsen came forward to the police, claiming to have seen Picton skinning a woman from a metal meat hook years earlier and that she hadn't told anyone about it out of (laughs) fear for losing her life. She went on to admit that she had blackmailed Robert about the incident she had witnessed on more than one occasion. So this was going on. Possibly even when his parents were still alive. So it's not sure when exactly he started killing his victims, but that could have been when she witnessed this him skinning a woman years prior. That could have been when Leo and me was being filmed. So, okay, so let me just make sure I have this straight because I'm a little confused. Parents died 1979-ish. Leo and me filmed late 70s to early 80s. Mm -hmm. And then he was caught in... Early 2000s. What happened in 1997? He assaulted Wendy. 1997, he assaults Wendy. And then early 2000s, he's caught. Yep. But we don't know. He's killed, they said, like, at least 80 uh, mm-hmm. Different DNA profiles were found. Mm-hmm. 27 women were confirmed. Mm-hmm. And so he's probably been doing this for a long freaking time. Yep. Even possibly when his parents were still alive because him and his brother were responsible for a lot of the farm's activities. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And Vancouver to Port Coquitlam, I'm not going to say it right, 
but where their family farm was was only 45 minutes. And when they threw those raves, a lot of the sex workers were from Vancouver, where they were being filmed. And also, because it is a pig farm, they're butchering and selling these pigs to local restaurants in the area. So you're saying this compromised meat could potentially have gotten into the hands of Leo and me staff. Staff. Absolutely. Ugh. I feel so freaking bad, not only for all these people whose lives were cut short, but also for all these people who ate this meat. I do too, because it's terrible and it's it's just something that is so unsettling. But this may be potential cause of why these people developed Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Parkinson's is characterized by abnormal protein aggregation, very similar to mad cow disease. He, and if you know what mad cow disease is, that's essentially when people eat products, bovine products that are compromised. Mm -hmm. There is growing evidence that abnormal protein synthesis can spread to neighboring brain regions in cause aggregation of endogenous prions in these regions. What I'm trying to say here is that there is a relationship between mad cow disease and Parkinson's. Both of them are caused potentially by prions. Prions are abnormal proteins that are essentially like clumps in your brain. So you can get prions with a uh, genetic mutation or being infected by the disease. It's characterized by fatal neurodegenerative diseases in both humans and animals. Consuming human flesh has been proven to lead to different neurodegenerative diseases because of prions. Prions are essentially misfolded proteins that can cause other normal proteins to misfold in a very similar way, leading to chain reactions of proteins being misfolded. These abnormal prions accumulate in the brain tissue, causing damage and result in diseases like Kuru, which was notably found among the four people of Papua New Guinea. So a tribe who was known for consuming the dead brains of humans, and because of that, they became very sick and 10% of their population died roughly. I think it was like 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. But Kuru, the illness, was transmitted through the practice of ritualistic cannibalism. And they were eating the dead brains of deceased relatives, mm -hmm. apparently. The prions that were present in the contaminated brain tissue would then infect the people who ate it leading to severe neurological deterioration, including tremors, loss of coordination, severe cognitive decline. Prions are heat resistant. So even if people who got their pork from the Picton farm cooked it or mm -hmm. prepared it in some way, they weren't eating it raw, it wouldn't matter because prions are present no matter what. Not you're, even auto cleaving to can it. get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So these abnormal chains in the brain causing neurodegenerative disease. Much like Parkinson's, Parkinson's has also been found to be characterized by abnormal protein aggregation. Mm -hmm. So leading me to a conclusion that hypothetically... The individuals who ate contaminated pork products on the set of Leo and Me may be the rationale behind why three of the 125 individuals went on to later develop the neurodegenerative disorder called Parkinson's. That was a good uh, summary. Thank you. It only took me like five tries. It's okay. And that's a good hypothesis, too. Because it, it makes sense, but, you know, potentially it could make sense. Now, it's just a theory. 
It could have been that they were exposed to an influenza virus. Mm -hmm. Could have been, you know, the gen genetic predisposition. Absolutely. But one out of every thousand persons is diagnosed with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So it's a statistical anomaly that three of 125, or I'm sorry, four, it was three and Michael J. Fox oh, okay. would go on to develop this mm -hmm. disease. That's true. It's that's an interesting theory. I'd like to research that more. Thank you, Reddit. Thank you, Reddit. You know, that's very interesting take because that's potentially, you know, could be another m more victims from this horrible crime by Picton. And was his brother involved? No, the brother denied any involvement. He never had charges for these murders brought against him. But I think it's pretty suspicious. How could he not Suspicious. It's sus. It's truly sus. But you know what's kind of scary to me, too, is how many other people, murderers, trying to rid of bodies for the food chain. Mm hmm All right, anything you want to add? No, interesting theory. Nicely delivered. I give you a... 8 out of 10. I'm hanging up on you. Mom gives me a 10. I give you a 10. That was a good Shut case. Shut up. You can't say. E. A pity 10. Chris. <laughs> Just kidding. I love you, The D. ending was a little rough. I got a little shaky at the end. No, you did great. That was a 10 out of 10. That was, I think, one of my favorite cases you've done. Really? Mm-hmm. That was a good case. That was one of your favorite? Yeah. He liked wow. it. Nothing it's like just piggy murder. Piggy murder. <laughs> It's interesting, and it also shows just how intertwined, you know, everyone's lives are and how one, you know, horrible person that can do these horrible things can impact so many lives. Not only the victims of the people he killed, mm -hmm. all their families, but also all these unknowing parties who are just there eating their meat. Just give me a pork chop. Mm -hmm. It also shows, like, how if only... People would listen, like, Wendy tried telling them, listen, like, this guy stabbed me a whole bunch of times, and they kind of dismissed it. It just shows how important it is to listen to people and what they have to say and not dismiss them, just because at first glance you see them as a drug addict or someone who, you know, is unworthy of time and, yeah. and not seen as being credible. So, always take a closer look. If you see something, say something. Exactly. Uh, what the fuck? You should is... Yeah, don't blackmail people. Just what? say what? something. Call How did she blackmail him? I don't... Just so that she had blackmailed him at some point with the information. I would have felt afraid to blackmail him. I mean, I wouldn't blackmail So, it's a bold move. It's a power move. I don't understand how she would say she was too afraid to go to the police, but then also blackmail a serial killer. She did it because she blackmailed it before she was called to police. I don't know. But either way, if only, you know, people Sucks. would speak up. Anyway, that's it for tonight, right, Dee? That's it. That's all I got. I feel like I gave birth. <laughs> you did give birth to a story. You gave life to what? it. Shut up. You're such a dork. All <laughs> right, everyone. We'll see you here next week. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, wait, 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 wait. The time is 1959. That's 17, or that's 7.59 for those of you who don't know, use military time. Sorry, I almost forgot to do our famous outro. Outro. All right. Peace out, bro. Peace out, bro. Peace out, bro. Bye. Bye.